they had to be apart. John Bunyan, you should read John Bunyan. Man, I tell you what, he's one of my favorites. John Bunyan was uh, persecuted. He was a Baptist preacher, and he was persecuted by the Anglican Church. He was imprisoned because he was preaching without a license. I got, I got mine. If y'all want, you want to see it, I have it right here. It's worth uh, less than the paper that it's printed on, as far as I'm concerned, because Bunyan told him, he said, you know, he said, I don't need a license for men to preach. He said, uh, so I'm called by God. Look at that. Isn't that cute? I've got it. i got it redo. You know why I carry this? So y'all don't go to jail whenever I marry you. That's the only reason that I, that I actually carry that around with me. So, yeah, Isabel's going, yes. <laughs> John chapter 5. I, I'm so grateful this morning. I, I really am. I, I'm so grateful for the freedoms that we enjoy. I'm so grateful that the, the founding fathers who came out of those places, those supposedly Christian nations, right, like the U.K., like uh, uh, the Netherlands, the places that they fled because they were persecuted for following the Word of God. If the United States were a Christian nation, there, there can't be, there's no such thing as a Christian nation. There's never been a Christian nation. The idea that you could have a Christian nation, that would be Rome. And think about that. Think about what Rome would do. Think about what Rome has done. Think about the persecution of Anabaptists that the Roman Catholic Church carried out Think about the, the proselytizing means that the Roman Catholic Church has used. Aren't you grateful that we have freedom of religion? You know, people are like, well, what if, gosh, what if a bunch of Muslims get voted into office? Why would they get voted into office if it's a majority believers in a particular area? And even if it is, we've got a law. We have this wonderful thing called law in this country. The only reason that they run us over is when they change the law or try to change the law. Isn't it wonderful? You know, the Supreme Court has upheld two really, really important cases this last week uh, that have to do with voter identification. And the Supreme Court came out nine to nothing on a couple of different deals. That's almost unheard of, nine to nothing from the Supreme Court. Fantastic, isn't it? Listen, folks, keep praying. God's not finished. God's, God's got a plan, and sometimes you have to get hit in the stomach before you realize, hey, we, we're going to have to do something about this, and I think that's kind of where we are. Well, we're keeping on through the book of John this morning, and in John chapter 5, Jesus is going to, I can't see, okay. In John chapter 5, uh, Jesus is, is going to uh, head back. He's been in, in Galilee. He's going to head back to Jerusalem. And so we're going to begin reading there in John chapter 5 verse 1. After this there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. And when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been there now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day, it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is it which saith unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and saith unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Now we're going to keep going, but I want to stop here and make a few comments about this. Let's pray together. Ask God's blessing on our reading this morning. Father, we just pray that you'd help us understand the Bible. This morning as we read, we pray that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher. 
And God, that, uh, that we might grow in grace and in our walk with you as we study the Word of God this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the first thing I want you to see is I want to see you to see that Jesus is doing the Father's work. Now, this is, this is incredible. By the way, if your Bible doesn't have verse 4, <sighs> please understand why I use this particular version of the Bible. Uh, there's this big controversy. No, that shouldn't be in there. Yes, that should be in there. Why do you think all those people were hanging out around there? And why do you think this man had the idea that when the water moved, that was when you had to get in? So here's the, here's the superstition of the day. Do you believe this, Roddy? No, I don't. I don't believe that an angel went down and stirred the water. I don't know what happened. Maybe it was an angel that came down and did it, but maybe it was a, an, an evil angel that took, that, when this took place. The uh, Bible doesn't tell us. It just says that this is what the people were expecting. Okay? So, what happened in that case? Every now and then, this pool would, would stir up. And the superstition of the day was, was the first person in got healed. Now, what's so wonderful about healing things, think about all the people that are there. So, it says there, it says that there were all kinds of different people there. Impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Now, there are some healings that it's very apparent, like this fella, wow, that guy's different. There are others that, well, you don't know, right? So somebody gets in the water, they come out, they say they're healed. Who knows? Who knows whether something happened or not? But this was all the people had. And so they took these people to this pool. Well, this man had been there for 38 years. I want you just to think about that for a minute. For 38 years. You know, after 38 years... A lot of your friends aren't around anymore, I'm sure. A lot of the people that used to come and hang out with you, a lot of the other sick people who hung out with you, that has changed and it's turned over and it's over. And this guy has completely given up because even though this is where he hangs out all the time, he knows when the water stirs, I can't beat that guy over there because his hand is withered, but his legs work fine and he's going to beat me to the water. And so this guy has just given up. This is where he resides. This is where he lives. But he's completely given up on the fact that anything is ever going to happen for him in his life. And he just lays there and watches these other people. You know, I can't help but think that this guy is, is kind of, uh, he, he kind of reminds me of a lot in our world. They've just kind of given up on anything ever happening in their life. Other people have opportunities, other people have advantages, but, but there's nothing really that they can do. And so there they sit, and even though they, they sort of still hang out in those places thinking maybe something might happen for them, they really have just kind of given up on life. It's why Jesus, I believe, asked them the question, Wilt thou be made whole? Do you want to get made whole? You know, there are some people who are not working and who do not want to work. Amen? There are some people who are sick and they like being sick because they like the attention they get. They like the, 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 the way that somebody takes care of them. They like this or they like that. They are called hypochondriacs, right? Uh, there are some people who like going to the doctor or the dentist. Let's make a show of hands. Do we have any dentists here this morning? I've got to be careful now. Okay. Nobody likes to go to... Anybody like go to the dentist? Anybody? Oh, you like going to the dentist. You have great teeth. Man, I tell you what. My old dentist, when I was about your age, he had fingers that big around. Anyway, so, so, so th there's, there's this question he's asking, do you really want anything to change in your life? Some people don't. And I think that's what Jesus had to bring into this place. I love the fact he doesn't debate about the angel. You know, the man says, you know, the angel comes, he stirs the water, and I can't get in after that happens. And the first guy or gal into the pool gets healed, and the rest of us get nothing, right? It's a lottery system. So you've got to be sitting there waiting for the angel to come. Now, nobody's ever seen the angel. They just see the water stir, and, and, and they've got to jump in. And, and this guy has given up on all that. So Jesus asked him, do you want to get healed? Do you want for your life to change? One of the things I realized... <clears throat> about, oh, I don't know, it's been a long time ago now. I was, I was getting pretty heavy. I decided I needed to lose some weight. 
I lost about 40 pounds. Um, most of it I did by picking up heavy stuff, running faster than a walk, and uh, quitting eating french fries and ice cream, and uh, drinking Cokes. And I changed a few other things, which I've given up on completely at this point in my life now. Anyway, I won't even go into it. But I did drop 40 pounds, and I had to work really hard to do it. But you know what it took for me to, to, to do that? I had to get mad. I had to decide, unless I change something, nothing's ever going to change in my life. And then so I got mad. I got mad at myself. I got mad at what was happening, and I decided I'm going to have to make some changes. And I couldn't, guess who, guess who makes excuses for not going to run? Right me. Guess who makes excuses for not picking up heavy stuff? Me. Guess who makes excuses for eating more than I should eat? Me. Guess who gives myself, you know, 14 cheat days a week with the ice cream? Me, right? So, so I can't blame anybody else. I couldn't even blame Wendy because she's, she's like, okay, tell me what to cook. And I'm like, well, just give me less, right? You know, and so, so anyway, you have to decide you want things to change in your life. And I think that's what Jesus is putting this guy to. Do you really want to get healed? Do you want for your life to change? For 38 years, you've been laying there. Now, I think Jesus is doing something else too because he picked this particular man. There were a lot of people there that day. He only healed one of them. He only asked one of them if they wanted to be healed. Now, why is that? I don't know. I, I can't answer that for you, but I know this. Jesus picked a fight that day. You say, well, Jesus wouldn't do something like that. Yes, he did. He specifically did. And look what it says there. It says there in verse... It's muted? Oh, so somebody's telling you, hey, turn it on. Sorry about that. All this technology, it's, it's, it's a blessing and you got to... Hey... Who's responsible for not turning on the thing? Right? Where were we? Verse 9. So, so think about it. Jesus walks up. There's a whole group of people there. You know what he could have done? He could have done, today is the day. Anybody who wants to be healed, line up. Right? Now, if he were a parlor show, if he, if he wanted to put on an act, if he wanted to draw attention to himself, if he wanted to, to, to show signs and wonders, that's what he could have done. Couldn't he? Well, of course he could have, but he didn't do that. He picked one guy out of the crowd, one guy in particular, one guy that he put it to, do you want to be healed? One guy who had to make a choice. He had to make a decision. And he said, yes. He says, he makes an excuse though. Look at verse 7. The impotent man answered him, sir, I have no man. When the water is troubled to put me in the pool, but while I'm coming, another step it down before me. I don't have anybody to help me in this situation. And I love it. Jesus completely ignores this. He doesn't argue with him. He doesn't go into a discussion about what he's going to do. He just tells him, rise, up, rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And the guy does it after 38 years. Now think about the miracle that has to take place here. You know about muscle atrophy. You know about bone density. You know about nerve damage. You know about all those things. And all those things had taken place in this man's lower core, legs. Uh, I mean, uh, your entire body. It takes your whole body to walk, balance, everything. And he just gets up. But the part where Jesus picks a fight is, is it says, immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Now that's the fight right there. He did this on the Sabbath day. You say, well, why is that a fight? Well, look what happens. Verse 10, the Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, wow, it's great. We've seen you there for 38 years. What happened? Oh my goodness, something wonderful happened. Praise God, a crippled man is walking. Is that what they said? No, and make no mistake, religious people never rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. They're mad because you broke a rule. And that's what happened. He says, it's the Sabbath day, and it's not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. Isn't it, isn't it wonderful? You ever been in that place? You just go along, and you're just following Jesus, and there's somebody over there going, uh-uh, naughty, naughty, because you're breaking my man-made rule. Now, let's go back, and let's talk about the Jews, okay? The Jewish people 
are some of the most idolatrous people that have ever lived. Okay? Israel is filled with idolatry since day one. Abraham was an idolater that came out of that, but we see his children having idols, household idols in their houses, Laban and his family having household idols in their houses. We see the Israelites being, being caught up in the idolatry of Canaan all the way through the idolatry of Egypt. Uh, they build the golden calves immediately upon Moses. He's gone for 40 days and they're building golden calves. And they're bowing down to them. And they're, they're, they're caught up with the, the Molech worship. And they're caught up with the worship of Chemosh and with Rimphan. And all of these different Canaanite and pagan uh, gods and goddesses that were around them. And it's always plagued them. Okay? But one of the things that the Jewish people did was, was they gave their rabbis way too much leeway. And their rabbis came up with something that was called the Oral Torah. The Oral Torah. And what the Oral Torah is, is just like what happens today. And you've got to be careful about this. When you have a study Bible, and I'll pick on John MacArthur this morning, okay? So you have John MacArthur's study Bible, let's say, and you have the Bible text here, and then you've got some notes down at the bottom or in the, the side. Maybe it's uh, C.I. Schofield. Uh, maybe it's the NIV study Bible. Maybe it's whatever. Whatever, your King James Study Bible. Ryrie. Let's pick on Ryrie a little bit. You got Ryrie's notes in there. You've got to remember, Ryrie's just a guy. John's just a guy. These are his notes, yes, and he's doing his best to try to help explain what's going on in the text, but he can be wrong. So can any commentator. But what the Jews had done is they had stopped reading the Bible text and they had got to this place where they said, well, Rabbi so-and-so says this, and Rabbi so-and-so says that. And they had come up with rules upon rules upon rules upon rules upon rules. Did you know that they actually had said that to carry your bed on the Sabbath day was a sin? So why do you think Jesus tells this man, hey, Rice, take up your bed and walk, and it was a Sabbath day, because he's picking a fight. He wants to intentionally send this guy out to show you, me, everybody that the religious world hates truth. They hate miraculous. They hate life. What they love is their law, and they don't even love God's law. They love their man-made law that goes over and above God's law. Jesus accused the people time after time after time, you follow the traditions of men rather than listening to the Word of God. And you exalt the tradition of men above. One of the things that Jesus loved to do was to eat with unwashing hands. Why? Because their oral Torah has this whole list of all these rules that they have to follow before they can eat. You have to wash. You have to wash up to the elbows. You have to do this. You have to... Did I ever tell you about my truck stop story? I was coming back from Arizona. I was down on, on the interstate and I was in, uh, I don't know, maybe off over there around Fort Davis Mountain somewhere. So I whoop into a truck stop because I'm starving to death and I made the terrible mistake of eating truck stop Subway. <laughs> still, I can still remember. Anyway, I go into the bathroom because I've been driving and there was a man in there and he's getting ready to have his Subway. Now he had already bought his Subway. He had his Subway in the sack and he had it laying beside him at the sink to which I went, ooh, gross as I went to the bathroom, right? <clears throat> and he's washing himself. And I'm talking about there's water everywhere. There's water all over the counter. There's water on the mirror. There's water. And he's washing. And I, I just stepped back and watched him for a little while. I'm like, you know, that's the most impressive hand washing i ever seen in my life. Now, this fellow was Muslim. But he's going through this ritual. And then he's going to pick up that sack that's been laying on that counter. In that place, where, anyway, it's, the, the, the hypocrisy that comes about from these kinds of things is paramount. It's off the charts. It's unbelievable. But that's what Jesus is addressing as he does this. He's picking a fight with them. They're not excited that a man has been healed after 38 years. They're mad because he was carrying his bed. And they ask him, who did this? You see, here's the thing. The Bible says... God created the earth in six days. Day one, he does this. Day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, and he rested on the seventh day. 
and very quickly after that he had to go back to work. Now he didn't rest because he was tired, he rested because he was finished, but when sin entered into the world, God had to go back to work. And Jesus carries on the Father's work, and he's going to begin to tell them that. And so he is working. Now, was this man actually doing work on the Sabbath day? No, he was back in his bed somewhere. They were the ones who had said, this is work on the Sabbath day. About 200 years after the time of Christ, they're going to write all of this down. They're going to write it down in something that's called the Talmud. To this day, Jews study the Talmud. A Talmudic Jew are the guys that you see that have the long curls, the black hats, th those kind of things. Also the guys who, they, they wear the kippah, and, and those kind of things. Now, the Talmud, you should look it up sometime and look at a picture of it. You know what it looks like? It looks just like a study Bible. Every page on it has the biblical scripture in the center, and then all the way around the margins, you have all of the writings. Rabbi Yoshi says this. Rabbi so-and-so says this. Rabbi such-and-such -such says this. It's divided into two portions. There's, other, there's a couple other deals that fall into that category, but the main two portions. And a lot of it has to do with how things are carried out with the temple. But the other stuff, the, the section on the Sabbath, is incredibly long. And it's rules upon rules upon rules upon rules upon rules. And some of those rules have to do with washing your hands before you eat. Like, which, by the way, find me one word in this Bible that says you have to wash your hands before you eat. No. They added all of this. See, that's the point. Now, should you wash your hands before you eat? I don't care. You listen to your mom and daddy about that. I could care less. Should you kill? No, because the Bible says thou shall not kill. Should you tell a lie? No, because the Bible says don't tell a lie. You see, were they supposed to work on the Sabbath day? No. They were not supposed to sell. They were not supposed to do gainful employment. They were not supposed to break ground. But a crippled man picking up his bed and packing it back to his house, was that work on the Sabbath day? Obviously not. So, so I want you to see what Jesus was doing here, okay? All right, let's go on. He says there, <clears throat> uh, they want to know, who is it that told you this? Verse 13, he says, and he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterwards, Jesus findeth him in the temple, and he saith unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole, and therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him. Do you notice that? You should underline that in your Bible. They persecuted Jesus and sought to slay him. They want to kill him because he told a man to pick up his bed on the Sabbath day. That's how violent and evil these religious leaders of the day truly are. Listen, folks, look around our culture right now today. Look at the people who want to kill you because you voted the wrong way. Look at the people who want to kill you because your skin is the wrong color. Look at the people who want to kill you because you believe the wrong things. That's not us. That's not followers of Jesus. We celebrate all people. Red, brown, yellow, black, and white. They are precious in His sight. That's what they taught me when I was little. We sang that at Sunday school all the time. Do we want to kill people because they don't agree with us? No! Matter of fact, we're willing to die to send missionaries to other countries to just tell them about Jesus all the time. That's what we're called to. We would be glad to go to some place like the Aqua Indians of Ecuador, like Jim Elliott did. Glad to give our lives in order that someone might hear the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, folks, 2,000 years ago, the oral tradition, religious leadership of the day was just as militant as ISIS, just as militant as the, the Taliban, just as militant as Antifa or BLM 
or any of these other terrorist organizations that are, that are doing their worst in our day and time. That's their mentality. It changes names, but the spirit doesn't ever change. You either look like us or you die. And that's not what we're like. That's not what Christians are like. That's not what, that's not what America is like either. Amen? Amen. So let's go on. We're, we're talking about this confrontation with the oral law. So Jesus enters into this. They want to kill him, and they, they seek to slay him because he's done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. When Adam sinned, God went back to work. Adam's sin disrupted the father's rest. And, and he continues to work. He's continued to work. And so Jesus says, my father is at work, and so am I. So this is another fight that he picks. Number one, the man carrying his bed on the Sabbath day. Number two, Jesus calling God his father. So look what it says. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Please don't miss this. Lots of people will tell you, Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. Yes, he did. John chapter 4. Jesus never claimed to be God. Yes, he did. John chapter 5, John chapter 10, as well as many other places. And the Jews didn't miss it. They knew exactly what he was saying. When he said, my father works up to this point and I work too, they knew exactly what he was saying and they hated him for it. They knew that he was saying that he was equal to God in this regard and, and it's part of the reason for their vehement uh, desire to persecute and to slay him. This is the confrontation with the oral law. And the oral law of Jesus' day is the Talmud of today. Okay? It is the Talmud of today. If you haven't ever looked, you really probably should. You should probably take a look at a little bit of what Talmudic Judaism actually teaches. Just so you understand that Christians and Talmudic Jews have absolutely nothing in common. Nothing. Nothing in common. Okay? Uh, we should evangelize the Jewish people. Just like Paul. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Amen? Right? So Romans 1.16, what's it say? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God and the salvation to everyone who believes, to the... Jew first and also to the Greek, which means that the gospel must be taken. Beware of people who believe in two covenants, like some of our Texas preachers do, who believe that Jews are saved by being Jews and then the rest of us are saved by trusting in Christ. That's not true. We've got to be very careful of that. And, and we need to understand that, that the... Here's the thing that's just, just mind-boggling as you think about this. The threats of hell that came from Jesus' mouth did not come to the whores, to the tax collectors, and, and to the thieves and people like that. They came to the religious leaders of his day. He called them the children of the devil. He never called a whore something like that. Think about this man. Jesus tells us specifically for 38 years, you have wallowed in your impotent state because of something that you did. You say, whoa, preacher, where'd you get that? Well, look at verse 14. Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. So you're saying that this guy was crippled because of his sin? Sure, why not? That's what Jesus told him. He said, now wait a minute. Are you saying that all sin leads to physical illness? No. As a matter of fact, there's, there's, there's sin that leads to physical ailment. There's stupid ideas and stupid things that we do that we face consequences for, right? You know, sometimes we do things that we know we shouldn't do, and, and uh, like, like texting and driving. Don't do that, because guess what? There might be consequences for that, and I mean, it might, it might, it might be really bad for you. Uh, so, so this particular man, in his particular case, apparently, whatever his condition was, was tied to his sin. And Jesus tells him, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto you. A worse thing. Man, 
You say, well, wait a minute, how do we sort that out? Well, I think you, uh, I think you ask God. I also think it's one of the reasons why the man was just kind of reserved just to, just to endure it. Because he knew whatever this condition was, he probably contributed to it. I think he knew that. So not only, and get this, this is really important. Not only is this man, he's made whole, not just his body. He's forgiven. Can you see that? He's, he's forgiven. Go and sin no more. By the way, this is what Jesus always says to people. He tells the harlot at the Pharisee's house the same thing. He tells the woman caught in adultery the same thing. Does anybody here condemn you? He said, no, Lord. Well, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Please don't make the, the, the foolish mistake of, you know, a lot of people say, you know, Jesus hung out with harlots and drunks and tax collectors and sinners. Yes, he did. But he did not condone their behavior. He did not like their behavior. He went and died on the cross to pay for our behavior and our sins. And he always called people to stop those things that are sinful. Should you be doing these things? No, we don't know what this guy's sin was. We don't have any idea. But he does confirm that. So, is all sin lead to physical ailment? No, nope. it doesn't. But some does. And you ought to ask God about that. I think I've told you the story. It's kind of funny. Uh, whenever Kyra was born, she winds up in the, in, in the hospital. We have to do a heart surgery on her. And Wendy and I are devastated. Our first kid's in the hospital, you know. And, and so I'm praying. And, and I'm thinking about this, you know. I'm thinking, is this something I've done? Is this, is this me? Is this a consequence of, of, of my sinful activity? And I'm pouring my heart out to the Lord. And please, Lord, if, if this is, show me, you know. And so then I decided, well, maybe it's Wendy. <laughs> and so I asked her about it. Hey! Is there something you don't need to, you need to tell me and God about this? And she's like, I was thinking the same thing about you. So we had to come clean and get everything. And we decided, okay, this is not, this is not that. Listen, God's not hiding things from you. You, you, you would know if, if God is chastening you. By the way, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us that the Corinthian Christians, some of them were sick, some of them were weak, and some of them were dead because of the way that they took the, the Lord's Supper and treated their church families. So yes, sin can have physical consequences to it. But not all sin has physical consequences to it. And by the way, Job's friends were dead wrong. Right? So you don't need to help anybody else out with this. You just need to make sure that you deal with it in yourself. And I learned that with my wife. I, I did not need to ask my wife that question. And believe you me, I'll never ask my wife a question like that again. Uh, anyway, it's kind of funny. But let's go on. All right, let's pick up verse 19. Now, Jesus is going to begin to explain what's going on here. He says, so, so they want to kill him because of this. Verse 19, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son of Man can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. What I want you to see is I want you to see the intimate connection of the Father and the Son. As we read this portion, I want you to see how intimately the Father and the Son are connected. He says, I don't do anything of myself. I am not acting independently of God. I look to see what the Father is doing, and I enter into that. It's what Jesus is saying. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that he himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that, that wonderful? Jesus knew that he was loved by the Father. And he knew that the Father, he, there was nothing that the Father wasn't letting him in on except when he was going to send him back. That's the only thing he ever says that he doesn't know. Verse 21, For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. He has life. Jesus has life. And he can give life to anybody that he wants to, he says. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Wow. The Father has committed all judgment to the Son. All judgment. We'll talk about that in just a minute. That all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Now I want to just stop, and this is my 4th of July message right here, verse 23. This is why, one of the reasons why I bring up Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine was unbelievably instrumental in the American Revolution. George Washington made sure that all of his troops received some of the pamphlets that Thomas Paine wrote. 
But I have gone back myself, and you should do the same thing. And I have read what Thomas Paine said. He said that he did not believe in Jesus Christ. But he did believe in God. Now that verse right there, as well as many others, tell us that that means that he's wrong, at least about that. If you're wrong about that, you're probably wrong about a lot of other things as well. If you don't honor the Son, you don't honor the Father either. This is a deist. What is a deist? A deist is a person who believes in God, but does not believe in Jesus Christ. They come up with this idea of God. Sometimes it's panentheism. They say that God is everything. God is the universe. Okay? Sometimes they believe in nature's God and the God of nature. Ever heard those words before? Yeah, Thomas Paine spoke about that. The Founding Fathers brought that up a lot. That is a deistic view of God. Now, some of them believe that this deist God was the great watchmaker, that he created all this, set it into play, and then stepped back and did not providentially or miraculously step in and change things. That would be Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson carved up his New Testament and removed all the miracles out of it. He liked all the rest of it. Well, guess what, folks? You don't get to do that. You know where those kinds of things lead. Well, that's idolatry. When you don't believe in the Father who sent the Son. John chapter 17, verse 3. You believe in God? I'm sorry, John 14. You believe in God? Believe also in me. John 17, 3. What does it say? I, I'm drawing a blank. I'll think of it as soon as I look at it. It says... And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Can you see that? This is so important. Just because somebody says they believe in God does not mean they are born again. It does not mean they are even talking about the same God that you and I are talking about because we are talking about the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at James with me real quick. This one, this one always makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck when I read this and think about this. James chapter 2, verse 19. This is the deist. Thou believest that there is one God? By the way, where did James get that phrase, one God? That comes out of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6. That comes from the Shema. There's, there's one God, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is... One, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. And these thing, commandments that I command you this day, you shall teach them diligently to your children. And on and on, right? Well, that's what he's talking about. He's talking to the Jewish people here as he says, you believe there's only one God. He says, thou doest well. Good job. The devils also believe and tremble. Can you see? The devils know there's only one God, but they're not putting their faith in his son Jesus Christ to be born again. And so you've got to be careful of deism. You've got to be careful of deism because it's everywhere. And America, there is an American brand of, of deism, I believe, that's been around since before America's inception. And that is a very patriotic, and there's nothing wrong with being patriotic, but it's a patriotic America that God is the God of America and that America is somehow all Christian. No, we're not. You're only Christian if you are born again. Amen? Now, should we be patriotic? Sure. You ought to love your country. If you don't love it, leave it. That's what Merle said, and I believe it. Hey, by the way, the, 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 the Olympian, right, who covered her head, she tested positive for drugs. How about that? Isn't that interesting? Do you think that an Olympian should dishonor the flag in the Olympics? Do you, I'm just wondering. Do you think that? Is anybody? How many of you think that she shouldn't be allowed to compete as an American who dishonors the flag in that way? Isn't that what the Olympics are all about? I mean, here's China. Here's America. Here's all. We've got crazy stuff going on in our country. But back to this verse. That men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. 
You see, this is where the, the thing is drawn. So the Jewish person says, I honor the Father. I keep the law. I am a Pharisee. I am a, a, a Talmudic follower. And you say, what about Jesus Christ? And they say, no. By the way, you should look up and see what the Talmud has to say about Jesus Christ. Get ready. They completely reject Christ. So do they truly honor the Father? No, they don't. You got to honor the Father with sent the Son. Now verse 24. Fantastic, absolutely incredible verse. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me. Isn't that wonderful? Look how Jesus ties himself to the Father. You hear the word of Jesus and believe on him who sent Jesus. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me. There's the Son and the Father. Hath. Now that is now. Right this moment. Right now. You have everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life that's past tense it's already happened you've passed from death to life so let's think about what that verse says by the way this is a memorizer this is an underliner this is the one that you go to you ever meet somebody and you say well, i don't believe in what saved always saved i i generally go to this verse as well as several others i like to take them here because this verse says that if i believe if I hear the word of Jesus and I believe what the Father says, that I have everlasting life right now, and that I've already passed out of death and into life, that means I have life right now. Because remember, Jesus has the ability to give life. That's what we just read. He has the ability to give life, just like the Father does. And I will not... Uh, I've already passed from death to life, and I will not come into condemnation. Those are, that is something that has happened to me right now. Now, when I was a little kid, here's the way I understood it. I understood that if I believe in Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, that when I die, I won't go to hell. Okay? That's true. But the idea that I have everlasting life now, I kind of put everlasting life off out there somewhere. So like I have this temporal life now and then when I die, then I get everlasting life because I believed in Jesus. That's not true. What's true is, is the moment that you put your faith in Jesus, at that moment you have everlasting life. At that moment you have stepped out of death, which that's what you live in the midst of dead men walking all the time right now. Because they are physically alive, but they're spiritually dead apart from Christ. But when you put your faith in Christ, that changes immediately. And I now have life, and I will not be condemned. Now, we could go to Romans chapter 8, go to 1 John chapter 5, we go to John chapter 10. We go to a whole bunch of different places that say the same thing. But this is one of those power-packed, really powerful verses right here that's just loaded full of goodness, and you should memorize it. But before you do that, you should believe it because it's fantastic. The intimate connection of the Father and the Son says that when I hear the word of the Son and I believe on Him who sent Him. Who's that? That's the Father. You see, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are very intimately connected. One God, three persons. It's truly amazing. Last thing I want you to see is, is you need to choose your side. You need to choose your side. That's one of the things that's kind of been interesting in the last year and a half is to, it's, be, it's become really apparent what side people are on in these days. That, that, that's, been, that's been really interesting to me. The, 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 the incredible turmoil that our world has gone through has caused people to go ahead and show what they really are in many cases. We're not talking about political stuff, though. We're talking about your walk with Christ. So look at verse 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is. That, that right there is very important. So he puts this future and yet right now, okay? So he says, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. Now what's he talking about? Well, he's talking about two things. The hour is coming, that's the future thing, and now is, that's the right now thing. So when you are dead in your sins and trespasses, according to Ephesians chapter 2, and you hear the gospel of your salvation, you who are dead are made alive in Christ when you put your faith in Jesus, when you believe in Him. But there is also coming a day when the dead literally are going to be raised to life. 
And so he says there in verse 26, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Can you see the intimate connection between the Father and the Son? So many places Jesus says. By, by the way, why is he pointing out this intimate connection? Because the Jews hate him? Because he just said that God is his Father and he's made himself equal with God. And he's saying, you betcha. Yes, I'm equal with God. God has life in himself. I have life. God has given me judgment. I'm the one who's going to carry out judgment. God has given me the ability to, uh, to, to grant this eternal life to anyone that I want. And that's what I'm doing. And the day is coming when people are going to hear and they're going to be raised to life. So he says, he says in verse 27, He hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. I want to show you something neat here. Verse 25. <clears throat> The hour is coming now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. So they're going to hear the voice of the Son of God. It's the title of Jesus, right? It's also a true description of Him. He is the only begotten of the Father. Now, I am a Son of God, and so are you if you're born again, right? But not like this, because He's the only begotten of the Father. Me and you, we got adopted into that family. We had to be born again to get into that family. But he goes on there and he says, he's given all authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Jesus is both Son of God and Son of Man. What's that mean? Well, when it comes to executing judgment, it's the Son of Man who's carrying that out. What does that mean? It means that when Jesus executes judgment upon mankind... He will be executing judgment upon a group of people of whom He has shared our existence. He became flesh. He lived among us. He's experienced our temptations. He's been tempted in every way that you and I have ever been tempted, yet without sin. He knows what it is to be limited by the flesh. He knows what it is to be hungry, to be weak, to be tired. He knows, he understands completely everything that you and I could go through, he has gone through as a man. And so someday when we stand before him, and when mankind stands before him, they won't be able to say, you don't know how it feels to be me. Right? That's a little Tom Petty for you. So he goes on and he says, Marvel not at this, verse 28, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. Now, that's all. All of them. Believers as well as non-believers. And shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of, of damnation. Now, what's interesting, turn with me real quick to Daniel chapter 12, because Daniel reminds us of something exactly like this. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Everybody's going to be resurrected again. Doesn't matter whether you're a believer or not. And by the way, it's not all going to happen at one time. We learn that as we continue to study the Bible. There's multiple resurrections. But, but he says that, that based on your faith in this life, you're going to be resurrected, and some people are going to be resurrected to shame and everlasting contempt, and some people are going to be resurrected to everlasting life, okay? And so he says there, they're going to hear their, the voice, they're going to come forth. In verse 30, he says, uh, I, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. So, so Jesus is telling us he's carrying out God's will in what he does. And this is my challenge to you today. This is, this is what I want to encourage you in. I want you, as you, as you consider what he's saying here, I, I just want you to think about this. Jesus is at work. He was at work then. He's at work now. And one of the things that he is confronting everywhere that he goes is he is confronting the religious system of the day. And he, he picked a fight. He intentionally does what he does with this man. He's, this isn't the only place. He's going to do this in lots of other... He's going to make mud and put it on somebody's eyes. And what do you know? Guess what? The oral law said you can't make mud and put it on a blind man's eyes on the Sabbath day. And he's going to do it. I mean, he's going to intentionally stir this up so that he can address it. 
because their religious system was so powerful and so entrenched and the people were so blinded. That's one of the things he's going to say about the Pharisees. How can the blind lead the blind? You'll both fall into a pit. And that was the religious leaders of their day. They were blind. They were lost. That's what he tells Nicodemus. Unless you're born again, you won't even see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus is going, what are you talking about? You're a teacher in Israel and you don't know these things? See, he was... He was part of that religious system. Listen, we're not talking about religion this morning. And by the way, for the last 2,000 years, doesn't matter what country you're from, whether you're free or slave, doesn't make any difference. This word has not changed. Our God has not changed. And he continues to do these greater works that were promised by the Father. And continues to do them through us. Because that's what Jesus is going to say when the Holy Spirit comes, that his followers are going to do greater works even than Jesus did. I just want to encourage you this morning. Do you know him? Do you have a relationship with him? Do you know that you know that you know? I love to ask people, if you were to die today, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? And they say, I hope so. Well, what is it that you're hoping so for? Are you hoping that you keep doing enough good works so that you can get there? Because if you are... What are you trusting in? You're trusting in your good works. But the Bible says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Ghost, right? So it's not about my religiosity. It's not about my Sabbath keeping. It's not about my church attendance. It's not about my tithing. It's not about my, my lighting of candles or my taking of the Lord's Supper or my getting dunked and baptized. Or, it, it's not about any of those things. It's about putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath, right now, it's yours, hath everlasting life, shall not come into condemnation, but is past from death to life. It's already passed over. We know how the game is played. We're not waiting to find out how it gets, how it gets finished. We know who wins. And if you'll trust Jesus, you can know for sure that you have eternal life right now. Let's bow our heads together this morning as, as we just thank the Lord for his goodness. Thank you, Lord, for this word. Thank you for Jesus. Lord, thank you for the freedom that we do enjoy in this country. May we never take it for granted. May we never take it selfishly. Thank you, Lord, for the hard work that the men and women did who designed our law, our Constitution. Thank you for the lives, countless, countless men and women who have given their lives to make sure that we stay free by fighting for that freedom. God, thank you for the men and women that are willing to do that right now today. But God, as we, as we study this this morning, I pray against the religion that so quickly and easily blinds people to the truth of Jesus Christ. I, I thank you, Lord, for the truth of a relationship with Jesus Christ, to hear your word and to believe on the one true and living God who can save us, forgive us, who gave your blood on the cross and gave your life so that we could be saved and forgiven. Lord, please, if there's someone here today that doesn't know you, I pray that today would be their day of salvation. That they call upon your name and put their faith in you. Believe in their heart and confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus and be saved. Thank you for this time. 